taking you uh, to children's worship. And while they're transitioning, you can turn to Psalm 34. And last week, Hans kind of got us thinking about the future a little bit and about the fear of the Lord and about the generational uh, thing that we need to have very clearly on our minds as a church. And uh, I'm going to kind of follow up on that uh, today. Psalm 34, I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 10. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. They say that actors should never act with animals in a scene because everybody will remember the animal, the dog, the monkey, you know, all that kind of stuff. They'll remember the animal, and they'll never remember the actor or the actress. I'm going to do one of the never-to-do preacher things this morning, and and I'm going to do it and then hope that you might even hear the rest of the sermon. But let me start with food on a Sunday morning before Thanksgiving. All right, hang in here with me. I want to tell you about my grandmother's house. I would go to my grandmother's, and your grandmother might have been like mine, and she would put on a feast for us to eat. There would always be two kinds of meat on the table, There would be all kinds of vegetables that had come from the garden. My grandmother made a macaroni and cheese that you had to hunt to find the macaroni. (laughs) Do you have a grandmother like that? It was incredible. I can still taste that macaroni and cheese. And out of all of that, she would also have a pizza in the freezer in case there wasn't anything on the table the grandchildren would want to eat. Right? I, I, haven't, I haven't eaten at my grandmother's house in over two decades, but I can still taste the food and remember how good it was. If you had a grandmother like that, my guess is you were never a picky eater. Because when you went to grandma's house, if it came out of her kitchen, you were going to eat it. Because you knew from experience it was going to be good. Most of life is like that. We encounter something, we taste the experience, and if we find that it is good, we'll keep coming back to that experience and coming back to the people that helped us have that experience. And not only that, we'll also tell others about that experience. After this service, you might try to convince me that your grandmother's macaroni and cheese was better than mine. But we'll have a long argument that we probably won't resolve. Because once you've tasted an experience, you have it firsthand and you want to tell others about it. The psalmist testimony in this passage is based on his experience with the Lord. He speaks of what he knows firsthand. He has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Here's the challenge for us. Not enough of us have experienced firsthand the taste 
of the Lord. Not, not enough of us have experienced firsthand the taste of the Lord. We can talk about somebody else's experience. We, we heard an experience, their experience, and we kind of liked it. But not enough of us have had our own experience with the Lord. And some of us have tasted the church, and we like it, but we haven't tasted the Lord. And this is the same problem the Pharisees had, that they had tasted the religious institution of their day, and they loved it. And that's what I love about the Pharisees because I love the institution of the church. It has helped shape me into who I am. But the Pharisees' taste of the institution of the church had overwhelmed and replaced their taste of the Lord. And so when God brought something new in Jesus Christ, they couldn't fathom a way to taste the Lord outside of the institution. And friends, I think that's, that's the challenge we're wrestling with. And, and that's the challenge most churches in our culture are wrestling with. We can too often speak firsthand of the institution, but we can't speak enough firsthand about the Lord. We've become so comfortable in our institutional identity that we have become blind to the way God is working around us. Have we, have you recently tasted and seen that the Lord is good? If we were going to share about that this morning, could you talk about something other than when you were baptized? C could you talk about something in the past week or two, relate it to your family, relate it to your job, relate it to your life in this community where you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good? And so as we move forward together as a congregation, one of my commitments is to provide more opportunities and varied opportunities so that people can taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and I just want to outline some, some broad things this morning as we look forward uh, to a new year, and as we continue to let God shape the ministry of this church. One way we, we have to taste and see that the Lord is good is by engaging God's word with one another. You've heard me say this a lot since I've become your pastor. But we're never going to taste and see that the Lord is good if we're not engaging Scripture and we're not engaging Scripture with each other. It's both of those things have to go together. That's the model of the New Testament church. The model of the New Testament church is not that they all took their little Bibles, ran off during the week, had their little quiet times, then showed up together on a Sunday and kind of ran through it again. The model of the early church is they were constantly together around God's Word. And they were letting it shape not only their individual lives, but their life together as a community of faith. And so we're going to keep talking about that. In January, we'll, we'll launch again with opportunities for us to engage God's Word together. And, and right now, on Sunday night, uh, our Sunday night group that, that I'm a part of, I tell you, that, that's one of the best, best times of my week is just being with that group, engaging God's Word. And that's been true in all the groups that I've been a part of um, 
as we've read through the Bible. And then we need to engage in prayer with each other. And this is where we struggle. And you might be tempted to get a little mad at me as I go through this point, but hang in there. Most churches let prayer become part of the institutional identity of the church and not an identity with the Lord and with each other. And because of that, we schedule prayer meetings that often lack any sense of prayer that the New Testament speaks of. And I'll just tell you from my own experience, the greatest times of prayer I have ever had, had, have never been in a scheduled prayer meeting. It's been praying with people in nursing homes, in hospitals, where it took everything I had to get words out of my mouth or to sit in the silence of the moment. Or there have been times of prayer with family and close friends when the joy was so overwhelming or the sadness and frustration were so great. I can't get you to taste and see that the Lord is good by calling an institutional prayer meeting and making you feel guilty if you didn't come or letting you check a box if you did. What we can do, what is biblical, is to encourage you to find a friend, to find two friends, to find your spouse, and say, can we pray together? And maybe on a regular basis, don't get legalistic about this, but get into a rhythm of it. Regular basis, you go for a walk together, and you pray as you walk, with your eyes open, seeing the needs of the world that God's placed you in. Or maybe you meet at a restaurant, and you pray, and you talk, and you eat. And you might be stunned by the people that are around you at the restaurant who say, huh, wonder what's going on there. You might be stunned by the doors that are opened as you do that. Or, or maybe you, you get your phone out, and you text pray each other. I do that with a, a longtime friend. I, I don't send them this long text. I just, a couple of sentences. Maybe you get on Skype or email or whatever technology you're comfortable using. And you pray with someone. Because you'll find when you taste prayer like that, you'll see that it's good. And we won't have to keep saying, oh, pray, pray, pray. Friends, I, I've been doing this for 24 years. I've been a part of a church for 48 years. And you go into any church and you ask them two questions, are you a friendly church? And they say, oh, yeah, we're so friendly. You ask the people who are coming to the church that question, you might get a different answer. And then you say, are you a praying church? And overwhelmingly, this is the answer they give you. We have prayer meeting. That's not what I asked, right? I didn't ask you if you had prayer meeting. I asked you if, you, if you're a praying church. And I'd feel much more comfortable with an answer that says, you know what? Me and, me and her, me and him, get together. We've seen lives changed. We're seeing, seeing healing happen. We're seeing restoration in our community because of our prayers. That's what I want to hear. And that's what we're going to try to do in the days ahead. If I didn't lose you there, <laughs> if I didn't lose you at grandma's table, let me talk about engaging generosity together. The religious leaders of the first century said to everyone, you have a financial responsibility to the church. And friends, that was 
And that is true. Jesus came along, and he lived a life of incredible generosity, and people flocked to him. They flocked to his generous love, his generous forgiveness, his generous healing, his generous teaching, his generous time, his generous resources. He was amazingly generous, and that brought people And we are most like Jesus when we are generous. Paul said the the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And friends, you're never going to get to cheerful if we treat generosity as something we just got to do. What I got to do is pay the mortgage and the electric bill. What I have the privilege of doing is being generous because the Lord has asked me to be generous. And we have made our giving, our generosity, such a private practice in the American church that we're not sure who has tasted generosity and realized the Lord is good and and who doesn't have any clue how to taste it. Let, Let me tell you a bit of my story on this. My parents, and and some of you had the same kind of parents, (laughs) my parents sent me to the baby room of the church when I was weeks old with my offering envelope, right? Did you have parents like this? Was it just me? I went to the baby room when I was weeks old with my offering envelope. I'm pretty sure I had not developed any income (laughs) at that point in my life. (laughs) But I tell people, I never made a choice to be generous. I never knew anything other than being generous. And that taste is so deep within me that it would be bitter for me to not live out generosity. But friends, private generosity doesn't help others taste and see that the Lord is good. I was talking to a friend of mine who is about 30 years older than me, a great lay leader in his church, and I just enjoy being around him. And he said his father-in-law taught the old man's Sunday school class. You kind of know what an old man's Sunday school class is, right? You got that in your mind? And he said he would tell his Sunday school class fairly routinely. He'd say, I I want you to tithe for three months. And if you miss any of that money, you just let me know privately, and I'll write you the check. I'll replace it for you. You see, his father-in-law understood something, that when people taste generosity, they discover that the Lord is good. When people get around the experience of being most like Jesus because we are expressing generosity, they find that the Lord is good. And so can I encourage us to taste generosity? And can I push a little further and ask you to maybe stop folding your check six times over and sliding it into the bottom of the basket or the plate? And can I ask you to talk about this in your small group, in your ministry area, to talk about the joy of generosity, the joy of being part of God's great work in this community and in this world. Now, friends, I want to make clear, there there is a very clear line between me and the giving records of this church. I don't know anything, and that's the way it should be. But I also know the national research that tells me in most churches better than half, around half the people, don't give it all. And our, our mistaken response to that statistic is to say, oh, we got to do a Dave Ramsey course. you got to preach harder on tithing. People got to be committed. I promise you that's not the answer. The answer is exposing them to the joy of generosity. 
And like I said, I don't know how to do that at this stage of my life because my, my, my mama gave me an offering envelope and sent me into the baby room. I just do it because that's what I've done. But, but some of us who have had to wrestle a little bit later in life with the joy of generosity, you got to talk about it. <laughs> you got to share it with somebody. It's not a lack of commitment. It's a, it's a lack of knowledge of the joy of, of being generous with God. And I do think the revival, the renewal that God is going to bring to the church in our culture is dependent on his people practicing generosity and talking about the joy of generosity. Got to taste and see it because the Lord is good. And then I want you to think about tasting and seeing the mission field. And I want to apologize first off on behalf of all pastors you have ever had and all churches you've ever been a part of. We've been so focused on just getting the institutional work of the church done that we've acted like that's the highest and greatest thing. And we've almost looked down our nose when our people have served in the community in dynamic and helpful ways. And so I want to get past that. I just want to say thank you when you engage the mission field. Because here's what I've found to be true in my life. 100% of the time, when people engage the mission of the community, the mission in the world, they see the work of God. They taste and see it, and they, and they realize it's good, and it changes their life. I'm not asking you to get on a plane this morning or to sell your house or to quit your job. I'm asking us to open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to the mission that happens every day in our facilities, to the large numbers of people who come through the doors of our facilities on a regular basis who don't know that the Lord is good, who've never had an experience to taste them and see that he is good. And I'm asking us to be, be more open to our community, to be missionaries right in the place that God has placed us. And if serving on a committee or teaching a Sunday school class helps you do that, then by all means do it. But if it doesn't, you say that. You hold us accountable for making sure that we're engaging you in the mission field because that's what God's asked us to do. And that you have the opportunity to taste and see that in the experiences that you have in this place. We'll do some things after the first of the year that we'll try to help you get out of your comfort zone a little bit. <laughs> but I want us to engage the mission field. This, this past weekend, uh, you know, you all have known all of the things that were happening. Um, of course, we have from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day a number of children and their families in our facility. Uh, Friday night, we had acoustic cafe, very intimate setting right here in this room. Um, I don't know the spiritual temperature of everybody in the room, but I'm guessing there were a few people who who really have not had an experience with the Lord that, that we would want them to have. And they were here. We had parents' night out. And again, I don't know the spiritual temperature of every child and every parent that was here for parents' night out, but I'm guessing a few of them need an experience with the Lord. We, we hosted the Embassy of Mexico the last four days, and uh, uh, it was jam full in here yesterday. And uh, it was just good to see our partner church uh, Maranatha, just in here engaging with people as they were getting some work done. Just tons of things that happen right here where you can taste and see that the Lord is good. We've got to engage the mission field more fully in the days ahead. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Hans asked a powerful question. In his message last week from Psalm 128, he said, How will my great-grandchildren benefit 
from what the Lord is doing in me today? How will my great-grandchildren benefit from what the Lord is doing in me today? And don't just think biology here. Think think spiritual great-grandparents and your biological great-grandchildren. And and folks, every time you walk into this building, which is kind of my experience when I come into this building, it is unbelievably humbling to think that 150 years ago, 190 years ago, 230 years ago, somebody was praying for me. Somebody was praying for whoever's going to pastor this church in the future. And somebody was praying for you. Lord, whoever's going to come beyond us, may they do the work that we've been privileged to do. And so how are our great-grandchildren going to benefit from how we're experiencing the Lord today? How, How is the way we're tasting and seeing that the Lord is good going to be passed down to my grandchildren? my great-grandchildren. Let me say it gently. But, but friends, a lot of our children and grandchildren are not in church because we gave them a taste of a religious institution. They're not here because we've said, here is the religious institution that you get to experience. And we like the taste of that religious institution. I like the taste of that religious institution. And we're a little hurt that they don't. And so we grieve over the fact that our grandchildren, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren don't have that same taste for the religious institution that we have. But friends, we got to help them taste and see that the Lord is good. Here, here's my hope if, if the Lord gives me time and, and gives me this privilege. I, I hope when I'm about 80, 85, when all I'm doing is uh, working with Emily and helping with the preschool ministry at whatever church we're a part of, and I'm never attending a committee meeting, never going to any of that kind of stuff, just, just serving. Um, I hope that my grandchildren or, or whoever might call me one day and tell me about what the Lord is doing in their church. And I hope I'll hang up the phone and look over at Emily and say, I got no earthly idea what that church is doing other than that people are tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And that's exciting to me. If they call me in 30 or 40 years and say, well, granddaddy, we'd have gone to that church, but they didn't preach like you preached. So we ain't going to go anymore. They didn't sing the songs we sung, so we're not going to go anymore. That would be devastating to me. We got to give our children, biological and spiritual, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, a taste of the Lord. That's what will sustain them through life. That's what will keep them involved in the mission. And so as we move to 2017, would you join with me in committing to getting a deeper taste or a first taste of the Lord in our lives? Not just so we'll have a better quiet time or we'll feel better about our church or have peace in our lives, but we'll have a better taste so that others will benefit from our experience with the Lord. And can we commit to doing whatever is necessary, whatever is necessary, to give as many people an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good? So in our staff meetings, what that means is we talk from time to time, and I say we all have kind of specific jobs and specific roles, but guess what? If something different happens... Our jobs and our roles are not guaranteed. We might have to do something else. We might have to be in a different ministry area than we currently are. Right? Because we're going to do whatever is necessary to help others taste and see that the Lord is good. So what does that mean? That means new worship opportunities. 
I'm not convinced that everybody who wants to taste and see that the Lord is good in Culpeper is available to our facilities at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. I'm convinced that there's a lot of folks who can come at other times and other places. And so we're going we're gonna to explore that. You know, giving people an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. Different ways of doing church. A little less institution and a little more mission. Folks, we're not going to move from the DNA of who we are. You'll listen to me ramble about that in January. I love talking about our religious liberty, and I love talking about some of the things we've started in this church. And I saw with my own two eyes, I'm going to give you a four-month teaser. I saw with my own two eyes uh, this week some incredible footage uh, from some history in our church. And I'm not going to show it to you till March. So you got to keep coming because you're not going to see it till then. But I've, I've seen amazing things. And so we're not going to walk away from who we've been. But we've got to do some things differently. More community engagement. Greater generosity. Serving. Showing humbleness. Listening. Providing as many opportunities as possible for people to taste and see that the Lord is good. And let me give you permission right now. Please don't show up to all, everything we do. That, that's not the intent. The intent is to provide as many tasters as we can and see who comes where and what the Lord does in that moment. And as we do all of that, let's be sure to engage Scripture with each other, to pray with each other, not because I called a meeting, but because it's just who we are. To practice generosity, not because me or Robert or somebody else stood up here and said, oh, we need more money. I don't want you to practice generosity because of that. I want you to practice generosity because the Lord is generous and we get to live out of that. And I want us to be on mission. I do want us to go to other places in this world, but I want us to be effectively on mission here. And so let's focus on those things. And as we do all of that, I think we'll find the Lord is good. Will you pray with me?